from the Mercy One Studio. Be Not Afraid is underwritten by Associated Ophthalmologists. Now, hear the good news and be not afraid. Good morning. Welcome to Be Not Afraid, Iowa Catholic Radio. Father PJ, Father Fabian. Good morning, Father. Let us begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Father, who brought the martyrs, to know your crucified Son and to imitate him even until death, grant through the intercession that the whole human race may acknowledge Christ as its Savior and through him come to behold, behold you for eternity, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever, and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And a very interesting week with uh, very remarkable saints. Benedicta of the Cross. Mm-hmm. So, uh, St. Benedict of the Cross uh, was uh, a, a philosopher who is sort of known in her own right just for the work that she did uh, and is, is still uh, widely read, especially amongst those who uh, dedicate themselves to, to philosophers attached to her immediately before the Holocaust. But in the church, she's remembered best because of her conversion to Christianity. She was ethnically Jewish. Um, and uh, and ultimately her martyrdom in the course of the Holocaust itself. And looking the who was the Pope that uh, verified was Saint John Paul II, the same <laughs> the same uh, person who also lived this uh, situation in World War II. Is in a very remarkable these connections from God, because we have another saint in this week that uh, Saint Mary. Uh, Marie Colby, that also show us all those turmoil moments in the history of the human being. I know? think it's it's very, very hard, um, and you and I aren't very old, Father, but I think it's very, very hard, especially for young people today, to understand just how profound an impact the Holocaust had on the lives, the imaginations, the memories of everybody who lived through it, not only the Jews who suffered the worst, but the but but the, the the Christians and especially in Poland, but both Saint John Paul II and Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, this clearly just it shaped their whole minds for the rest of their lives. Um, Pope uh, John Paul, of course, was very keen on raising to the altar several of the people that had died during the Holocaust and 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 on recognizing um, the ways in which the Church had had fallen down as well. Pope Benedict, of course. Um, was himself uh, deeply maligned uh, and accused of cooperating with the very people that had subjected him um, during uh, during the same period, and so raising up people like Edith Stein and uh, and Maximilian Kolbe is part of the church's way of coming to grips with this most horrific event in human history. To me, always when we back to those kind of movies that try to in a documentary manner show us the horror experience for many souls during the World War II, especially in the Holocaust as well, show us uh, how deeply is evil action when blamed completely mind and heart of the certain leaders. And uh, to be honest to you, Father, it's not a big difference with some leaders today, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And actually, this is in a very remarkable manner how the saints can assume the pain assume hurtiness for the conversion of the souls as well. That means sacrifice, the martyrs as well. You know, we spoke uh, on last week's show about the importance of Christian identity and the way in which the Christian ultimately finds her identity most profoundly in the Holy Eucharist. Um, I, I think what, what, what keeps the church on track when we're at our best, what prevents us from becoming the kind of ideologues that perpetrate precisely the kind of disasters that, that we mourn now um, is this element of mission. And the, the, the Eucharist is fundamentally a sacrament of mission. It puts us on mission. That mission is in service not only to those who believe, but maybe first and preeminently to those who don't, uh, which is why both Edith and, uh, and um, Maximilian's life and mission was spent not only amongst the Jews who were being persecuted, but these secular non-believers who are probably much more like the people that you and I find ourselves amongst today. Absolutely. And uh, sometimes when we have been experienced any kind of physical painful, emotional painful, or psychological painful, we are in completely devastated circumstances. But those guys that have been 
living that kind of very awful circumstances, right. physically, emotionally, psychologically, really in a remarkable manner, praise God through their woundedness as well. Yeah, there's a grit and a resiliency that attached uh, to these people that's hard to imagine today. You know, for us, the the Wi-Fi is too slow or the Netflix don't work or my car doesn't uh, start. And, or the, and, war, the warmest, the warmest moment. In, right, in the, right, right. It's too hot or it's too cold and we, and we lose it and I might just stay inside all day kind of thing, right? Right. And, and, and these people, you know, got uh, stripped naked and sent off to camps and weren't fed anything for months and then were told they were going to be murdered to death. And they sang hymns of praise. You mentioned a very interesting point to thinking about it. Sometimes as a human being in a very contemporary contemporary days, we are completely denied pain in a multiple ways. We deny the cross. We deny the pain. I want to easy life, very soft life. When, when these kind of events, tragedy events arrive to our life, we are completely devastated. And sometimes pain is also transforming, challenging, and a very useful, useful for our life. One of the most profound lectures I've ever been present at, I can't remember the fellow's name. He was a doctor speaking for the Catholic Medical Association. And he was talking about end-of-life issues this way um, and the way in which we reverence the bodies of, of, of those that we, we care for. And, of course, you want to help people not experience unnecessary pain. But he said, we're the first generation of people that lived under this sort of misapprehension that death should be painless. Um, that like nobody ever thought that before because it seemed pretty obvious that the thing that ends your life is going to hurt a little. <laughs> and so he said part, part of the problem is, right, that the tradition is very big on, on a well-provided for death, making sure that people are as recollected as they can be so that they can enter into eternal life with sort of game face on, head and heart made pure. Um, and, and that very often we rob people of that. Um, by doping them up so much they don't even know what's going on. Now, it's not meant to be a, a tirade or make anybody feel guilty about the way you cared for Granny when she was dying. This is not about that. But it's a symptom, I think, of our tendency um, really to diminish the importance of the body and the way in which growth and pain both serve to make us better and more ourselves, not less. Absolutely. Iowa Catholic Radio, be not afraid. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and John Lee and Eddie in the Morning is provided by Blessman International. Blessman International partners with volunteers and donors to provide sustainable programs for children in South Africa by leading a 12-day, all-inclusive experience sharing the heart of Christ with vulnerable children in South Africa. Teams are forming to do something significant in an African child's life. Learn more at blessmaninternational.org. That's blessmaninternational.org. Thank you, Blessman International, for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Catholic Women Now provided in part by Permar Security, providing security solutions for homes and businesses since 1953. Permar Security is a Catholic-owned family business supplying security systems, access control systems, video surveillance, fire alarm systems, and video doorbells. All alarm systems are monitored out of their monitoring center located in the state of Iowa. Permar Security, 515-244-5660, permarsecurity.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Dowling Catholic Sports is provided in part by Ashworth Vision Clinic. With two licensed optometrists, Barbara Sheets, a Dowling graduate, and Dr. Craig Harper, the Ashworth Vision Clinic team provides complete eye exams, contact lenses, glasses, glaucoma testing, and pre- and post-operative care. Ashworth Vision Clinic is located at 60th and Ashworth in West Des Moines. 515-440-4610 or online ashworthvision.com. Thank you, Dental Associates, for underwriting Dowling Catholic Sports 365. With over 40 years' experience, Dental Associates is a group dental practice with the mission of promoting optimum health and well-being to all patients, providing preventative, restorative, and cosmetic dentistry for the entire family. Message underwritten by Dr. Kenton Gleichman, Dr. Steve Carbaca, and Dr. Ben Nagel. Dental Associates, addressing your smile, needs, and dreams. Online at Des Moines-DentalAssociates.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and John Leonetti in the morning is provided by Five Sons Naturescapes. Five Sons Naturescapes is a Catholic veteran-owned family company providing premium outdoor landscaping. Clean up and restore outdoor living space with retaining walls, privacy fencing, pergolas, paver sidewalks, and patios. Issues with soil settling and water around the foundation and yard? Five Sons Naturescapes can grade and install drainage tile to help. Five Sons Naturescapes online at fivesonsnaturescapes.com.
Welcome back to Be Not Afraid, Iowa Catholic Radio, Father PJ, Father Fabian. St. Joseph, the year of St. Joseph, in a very remarkable manner, reminds us uh, an a humble man. Humble man, good service, but also sacrifice. Mm. What did you first imagine when we're talking about St. Joseph, Father? Mm. I, I think my first sort of image or whatever is, 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 is of Joseph sort of covering the virgin, holding the child. Wow. Um, you know, in this very paternal, uh, uh, genuine sort of a- act of care. I think um, very often we, we get caught like in quibbles around St. Joseph or ideas around St. Joseph. I'm not sure any of that's real helpful. I, th- I, I think the reason the church holds this guy up is probably because we know so little. He could be anybody, and that's the point. And to me, it's in a very admire that silence, humility, he did not... Uh, performed a movie star, attractive role, but very deeply and remarkable care about our Blessed Virgin Mary and obviously our Lord Jesus Christ himself. You know? I think part of the appeal of St. Joseph in more recent times, because it is worth saying, the, the kind of rise in devotion to St. Joseph that we know now is not um, typical or normal in church history. There's something new and different happening here. Um, and it runs alongside a kind of... Um, consequent or maybe antecedent uh, prior to um, loss and devotion or awareness around the character of John the Baptist. Even physically in churches, the arrangement that most of us are familiar with in this part of the world, with the Virgin on the left and St. Joseph on the right, that's a relatively new thing in church history. For large, large, large portions of church history, you would have the Virgin on the left and John the Baptist on the right. In Orthodox and Eastern Catholic churches, the Baptist is always paired with Saint, uh, with the Blessed Virgin. It's always those two. Um, this is not a, an apology for John the Baptist. That's not the idea. But, <laughs> but, but, but I think what's going on is the Baptist, uh, much like St. Joseph, is this very humble character. I must decrease so that he can increase. It's, it all points to Jesus. It's not about me. But the Baptist is hard to kind of wrap our arms around. He's a sort of a wild man and, and like, like a crazy monk. I don't know, like Rasputin if he was actually holy or something like that, right? And so we don't know what to do with that. But St. Joseph just seems like your Uncle Bob. Like he, he, he is the original everyman. Um, and, and, and the work that he did was in many ways not that remarkable at all. Like he fed and clothed the wife and kid. Oh, so does everybody else except you and me. But like, but like for the most part, right, this is just what people do. Um, and that he could find terrific holiness, not just like boilerplate holiness, but terrific holiness right there in that. I think that has tremendous appeal for people today. And at the same time, Father, uh, when we speak about St. Joseph, we're talking about a very unique masculine model, figure, and witness from God's love to woman unconditionally. And this masculine is completely completely different scenario that macho, quotation marks, right. in the current world, tender, compassion, you know, gentle, in other words. Right. Yeah. So so the church has had a masculinity problem for centuries. Um, and this, is, this isn't an opinion. Like, there's lots of academic stuff to back this up. There's a terrific book, uh, probably 15 years old now, called The Church Impotent by Leon Poodles um, that, that deals with this. But um, uh, Western churches, Catholic and Protestant, have been disproportionately filled with women for at least 500 years. Um, when you survey sort of cultural artifacts, stories, movies, TV shows, radio plays, all that kind of that stuff, you're much more likely to find a sort of fay or a feat cleric in the West. This is totally unknown in the Christian East. Like they're just – you don't have flouncy priests in Greek shows. That doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> Russians would kill them or something. So, um, so they, like it's, it, it's, it's, it's a cultural piece, and I think it has a lot to do with – the way that veneration to the Blessed Virgin happens in the West. And St. Joseph is the kind of, um, not counter, but complement to that, right? The balance. It, it balances it back out. And so you do have this genuinely masculine guy, this in some ways very masculine guy, but there's no hint of machismo. No. The authentically masculine man doesn't need machismo. Absolutely. He's, he's strong enough in his own character, and he really, he, he genuinely doesn't care what anybody thinks, as opposed to the uh, machinisto who, who, who only cares about what other people think and, and, and shows you how much he does by telling you he doesn't. And for a certain period of time, uh, our diocese led by Bishop Johnson had been in a very remarkable manner moving forward to give us an, a consistent and persistent about St. Joseph devotion, especially in, in concordance with the Holy Father, 
invite us to leave the Giet of St. Joseph. So we have a couple events right. coming so up. Right, so several of the parishes, yours and mine, I think already, uh, have done individual parish-type consecrations to St. Joseph, but there's a diocesan wide one that, that's coming up this uh, this Sunday, August the 15th, the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin, um, at 4 p.m. in Irish Settlement. This is for all people that have, that have kind of been doing this stuff on their own. There's resources on the diocesan website. It's not too late to sort of plug yourself in. You know, the, these these Marian or Josephite consecrations, they're not, um, you know, they're not some weird species of Catholic magic. That's not what's going on here. But they're meant to be acts of devotion that stir up in us the stuff that should be there already, but for most of us is missing, um, which which makes us more receptive to the grace God's trying to give us and allows us to bond more closely with the saints who draw us always to Christ. And also to identify our masculine perception about human being with a remarkable man, a strong, faithful, humble, and tender, like St. Joseph. And really we are in need in that kind of model roles from our You wife. know, one of the things that has struck me in this year, St. Joseph Father, is that as, as much as I've used this, and I'm sure you have too, many priests have seen this as an opportunity to re-engage men in the church, is the way in which women have talked to me about having never really thought about St. Joseph. Like, they're developing a relationship with this person now, too, and it's actually healing their own relationships with men in their lives. Father wounds or wounds from bad boyfriends or or that sort of thing that, like, there are good men who actually will care about me and not want things from me and and uh, and and that that's not only possible here on earth but in heaven. So please remember the consecration this Sunday at Irish Settlement at 4, celebrated by Bishop Johnson, and if you're able, please attend. Iowa Catholic Radio, be not afraid. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio's broadcast of Dowling Catholic Sports and Activities is provided by Kemen. Kemen strives to sustainably transform the quality of life every day for 80% of the world with their products and services. Kemen, using science to transform the world. Online at Kemen.com. The August Man Up West Power Lunch is Friday, August 13th at noon, St. Francis of Assisi in West Des Moines, with lunch provided by the West Des Moines Chick-fil-A and University. Deacon Mark Campbell will be discussing the year of St. Joseph and the consecration to St. Joseph. Learn more at iowacatholicradio.com. Thank you, Golden Rule Plumbing, Heating, and Cooling, for sponsoring my show. John Lee and Eddie in the Morning on Iowa Catholic Radio. Golden Rule, servicing Des Moines for over 15 years. They obey the rules to live by, especially the Golden Rule. Online at goldenrulephc.com. Thank you, Big Red Q Quick Print, for underwriting the sports report. Family owned and operated since 1980, Big Red Q Quick Print is a full service print shop, ready to help you with all your printing needs with speed and accuracy. Big Red Q Des Moines.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio provided by Farm Bureau agent Cindy Schulte, an authorized independent agent for Walmart Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Iowa, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Learn more at 515-226-2111 or cindyschulte.com. Thanks to Blessman International for their support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Every year, Blessman International leads teams of Central Iowans to share the compassionate heart of Christ with orphans and vulnerable children in South Africa. You can learn more and sign up for a trip at blessmaninternational.org. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio is provided by Edible Arrangements at 2020 Grand Avenue in West Des Moines, helping people celebrate all kinds of occasions with food arrangements, treats, gifts, and more online at ediblearrangements.com. Listen to The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr Wednesday mornings at 10 on Iowa Catholic Radio and on demand at iowacatholicradio.com and the Iowa Catholic Radio app. Welcome back to Be Not Afraid, the solemnity of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. This is an, a very remarkable, remarkable event for us. And I'd like to focus, invite it to you, Father, obviously, to focus in the Magnificat. The, the gospel passage for this Sunday is, is, is long and extended, but uh, the major portion of it is the Magnificat, Mary's great song of praise. And, and this really should sit at the heart. Uh, like, we should all memorize this and just have it live inside ourselves. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations, we call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. 
He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has showed the strength of his arm and has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. The Gospel of St. Luke, from which this is drawn, has been called uh, the, the, the Broadway musical of the New Testament because it's just full of songs. Um, he has the song of uh, the, the Virgin, the song of Zechariah uh, w- around the birth of the Baptist, um, and famously the Nunc Dimittis, um, the, the, the song of Simeon. These serve as the structural points that hold together the divine office, the basic prayers of the church each day. And so most of us, uh, priests and religious who pray the office every day, have, at least mostly, uh, these songs committed to memory because they're simply part of our daily prayer in the way that the Our Father, the Hail Mary, and the Glory Be are probably part of every child's daily prayer. The Magnificat itself is, is very significant because as a song, as a, as a musical and poetic piece, it draws on Old Testament traditions both the song of uh, Miriam um, from the Exodus. So, so the song that Miriam, the sister of Moses, uh, begins as they come out of the Red Sea and enter um, onto the dry land. This is, of course, the person that the Blessed Virgin is named after. It's the reason there are so many Marys in the New Testament, because Miriam was one of the most common uh, girls' names then because of the sister of Moses. Miriam. Miriam. And then... Um, and then the the structural points uh, are are closely related to the song of Hannah in the first book of Samuel, uh, the mother of of the prophet Samuel, who like the virgin was not supposed to have a baby and then suddenly found herself going to have a baby, um, and and she when like Mary when she finds out about the birth of this child she bursts into song and praise and this is this is the song uh, that, that Hannah sings and so Mary the Blessed Virgin is sort of riffing off of both of these traditions, and it is sort of the perfect synthesis of all the things from the old and all that is to come. Beautiful. And uh, to me, it's very inspirational when she said, my soul proclaims, and then he has mercy, he has shown this strength, he has cast down, he has filled the hungry, he has come to the help of his servant. She delegate all the blessings, all the divine interventions in the presence of God himself. You know, the, the, the present translation in English is uh, unfortunate. <laughs> um, the, the reason it's called the Magnificat, right, is because the, the, the opening words in Latin are Magnificat anima meum. Um, my soul magnifies the Lord. Well, the, 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 the idea here is not God doesn't get bigger because I look at him. But I can see God more clearly, or I can make God more manifest when this happens. And so that God makes me bigger from the inside out, and that makes God's presence more known and felt in the world. It's an, uh, <laughs> an, uh, an, a clear expression how the Blessed Virgin Mary loved God. And loved God through the literally historical and detailed Actions and presence and intervention from God in the life of the people of Israel and also in our life as well. Every time we Catholics say the Hail Mary, repeat the words of the angel to the Blessed Virgin, we fulfill the prophecy that Mary makes in the Magnificat. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. Blessed are you among women and blessed Blessed is the the fruit fruit of your womb, womb, Jesus. Jesus. So 2,000 years later, we're still calling her blessed as the angel did. And, and, and Elizabeth, as Elizabeth did, rather. Um, the, uh, the, the move here, right, is that, is that Mary sort of perfectly connects the promises of the Old Testament with the fulfillment in the New. And she is the model, the exemplar, the, 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 the first and best person to show what this looks like in the church. So that's why the Holy Father calls Mary the first and best disciple. Um, it's why Mary is the, the image of the church, because we're all supposed to end up ultimately like her. And uh, the, the unconditional humility from our Lord, Blessed Virgin Mary to delegate the power and action of God through her, mm. not in her, that respond to certain traditions in our Latino community that uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe 
perform miracles mm -hmm, mm -hmm. versus that she is an, a great advocate to apply to the intervention of our Lord. In sure, our sure. So there's always this danger, and, and this deserves to be said, there's always this danger with Marian uh, festivals and Marian devotions with somehow missing the point. But what Mary always does most perfectly is point to Jesus. And so each one of us are to be like Mary, a, a Theotokos, a, a God-bearer, carrying Jesus Christ into the world. Approaching, ending our program, let us pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty, ever-living God, who assumed the Immaculate Virgin Mary, the mother of your Son, body sold into heavenly glory, grant, we pray, that always attentive to the, teen, to the things that are above, we may marry to be shares of her glory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Iowa Catholic Radio. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Jesus is on the way to encounter you. Be Not Afraid is underwritten by Associated Ophthalmologists. 